Welcome to Kiffin's Keep, an intellectual resource at the Pillar and Butchers with the Truth, which is the church. This is a project at the London Lyceum, which is all about serious thinking for a serious church. I'm Jordan Stefaniak, president of the London Lyceum and host of Kiffin's Keep. And as always, I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to like the video if you enjoy the content. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything that comes through. We got all sorts of quality stuff all the time. And then remember to comment if you like the content or if you disagree with it or if you have thoughts or ideas. Love to hear from you guys. Now let's get down to business. This episode is designed to be a top reasons for or a top, a top I guess I don't know what it is, a, a top whatever, top X. I've been trying to do once a month or so, every four episodes essentially giving you the top reasons for different things. Talked about the top reasons for divine simplicity recently. And now I want to talk about the top reasons to be a Protestant. I have plans to do a top reasons to be a Baptist, but we'll start here with Protestantism to begin with. And naturally, what's the number one reason to be a Protestant? Well, it's to because you believe in the Bible. I mean, that's tongue in cheek, but that's also legitimately why you should be Protestant. If you think uh, scripture is authoritative and true, that Romans 3 through 5 teaches justification by faith alone, then naturally you want to be a Protestant. Um, if you read the canons of Trent, you will have to say, well, that doesn't comport with what I find in Romans or in other Galatians, where justification is by faith alone. Let's look at canon. I mean, there's a bunch of canons in here you can go through. Canon 11 says that if anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and the charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Ghost and is inherent in them, or even that the grace whereby we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be anathema. Well, what are we to do with that when Paul tells us that we're justified by faith alone? Now, I get it. Rome has sophisticated answers for these things. And a lot of the canons in here, I think, are ultimately based on a little bit of a misunderstanding, which is natural. That happens in any any a lot of these debates. There's misunderstandings where you think that Protestants don't actually care to do good works or, or Protestants think that, you know, X, Y, Z. And so they put in these things that are just mischaracterizations of Protestants. But fundamentally, the Protestant claim is that justification is by faith alone, and therefore you should be a Protestant because what we find in Romans 3-5, through what we find in Galatians, is that Paul is quite clearly saying that justification is by faith alone. So naturally, if that's true, you want to be a Protestant. So that is the top reason. But there's also other biblical reasons. I mean, I think of the, the priest system that you have in Rome. That uh, doesn't seem to comport with the fact that all believers are priests, as we find in uh, the text of Scripture as well, where we all have direct access to God. We find in Hebrews, Jesus is our high priest. We don't need any more priests because now I have direct access through Christ, my sole mediator. I don't need a further mediator to help give me access to God in any way. But the Orthodox are also wrong here, too, and there's more reason to be Protestant and not just Orthodox. They reject the Filioque Clause, which is uh, for the entire Western tradition, uh, scriptural, and uh, quite important to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and the Son. But they also have a defunct view of predestination and free, free will, where they're rejecting vehemently predestination, which is found all over scripture, Ephesians 1, Romans 9, all these other places where what, whatever your view of predestination is, predestination is something you have to deal with. And so there are good reasons to be Protestants, great reasons to be Protestants, just based in scripture alone. So just say the Bible. Um, and that's a sufficient reason, in my view, to be a Protestant. But there's other reasons. You could say, I think uh, another reason is that you have both a freedom from tradition, but also a freedom of a rich tradition in Protestantism. What Rome often and or, the Orthodox often like to say about Protestantism is that they don't have a tradition. The reality is we actually have the best tradition because we have access to all the great resources in the patristic and the medieval era and saying that is our tradition. Just like William Perkins would say that, that we are the true Catholic Church. It's Rome and Orthodox. It is not, no one gets to have the monopoly on the word Catholicism. So I prefer to call them Rome and not Roman Catholics because it's the Protestants, the Reformed Protestants who are the true Catholics. 
and we have access because these are this is our heritage. Augustine is our heritage. It is not a, exclusive of Rome. Uh, Cyril of Alexandria or Maximus the Confessor, that he is not exclusively the property of the Orthodox. He is the property of Protestants. He's shared intellectual Protest, uh, property. And as we go on to the Protestant Reformation, we have this great rich heritage of all these great thinkers. We have Calvin, we have Turretin, we have Junius, we have Maastricht, we have uh, Vermeule, we have Bavinck, we have Owen, we have Charnock. We have all these great thinkers in the Protestant heritage that have developed a robust intellectual ecosystem for thinking wide, widely and wisely. So I think if you want to be a Protestant, this is another great reason, because you have all these great powerful minds. You have, If you want to think super contemporary, you have C.S. Lewis, great thinkers like him who are making a significant impact uh, across the system. Now you have others, uh, other reasons. So let, let's go to another reason. Um, another reason to be a Protestant is that you don't have to agree with Rome, that the Antichrist is the head of the church. So if you look at the Second London Confession, chapter 26, section or paragraph four, says the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church, in whom by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling, institution, order, or government of the church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalts himself in the church against Christ. And all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So as a Protestant, we don't have to believe in the Antichrist as head of the church. We don't have to have this faulty hierarchical system that is nowhere in Scripture and that is ultimately maintained by uh, foolishness. So if you want to, to go with the system of Scripture where you have elders and deacons, that's what you find in First Timothy, that's what you find in Titus, and that you don't want to have the Antichrist as head of the church, then come on, the water's fine, become a Protestant, right? Now, of course, Rome is going to say, well, we find in Irenaeus and all these other people in the, in the early church that they develop a highly sophisticated hierarchical system, and eventually in the 4th or 5th century, Rome becomes uh, paramount and supreme, like first, first among equals, and then becomes ultimately the, the sole source of jurisdiction. And therefore, we should listen to how the saints of old have uh, developed this system and say that this, the, the Pope is the vicar of Christ or whatever. And I, I say that that's hogwash. You, number one, I think, uh, read into a lot of these early sources, things that aren't there uh, based on later developments. And you're also just simply not comporting with what Scripture teaches. And and really, I we do find as, as Protestants that the, the Pope is the Antichrist. And how can you? So I don't have to go get play defense for Pope Francis, who's going out and saying it's permissible for transgenders to be baptized. and. <laughs> to serve as, <coughs> excuse me, godparents. I don't have to play defense for that. I don't have to explain it away. I don't have to give a rationale for it. Rome does, and they have, like, you can play smokescreen and fog all you want, but the reality is I don't have to deal with that as a Protestant. So that's a really good reason to, to not be a, to, to not be a Rome. Uh, I guess, you know, the Orthodox don't have to deal with that, but the Orthodox have all sorts of their own issues with their intertwinement with the state and other things that have developed over time. Now, another reason to be Protestant, this is, I guess, my fifth reason to be Protestant would be the simplicity of the Protestant structure, the simplicity of worship and the and the order of the means of grace. So in the Orthodox tradition, you have a highly sophisticated and visual worship that um, I think has a tendency to distract. While there may be a, an appeal among younger, um, angsty individuals in, in America that look at the Orthodox and say, wow, look at all this beautiful bells and whistles and everything. Well, I think you're actually sort of being distracted from what is core to the worship of the church, which is Christ and him crucified as what Paul preached and swore to know nothing else of. And then you have the simplicity of worship compared to Rome, uh, where you have the simplicity of the means of grace with the word and sacrament and the sacrament is simply the, the table 
and baptism, and it has no additional sacraments where you you have all these other sacraments that the Roman system has devised that simply you don't find in the Bible and you don't find ultimately significantly in church tradition until later on, significantly later on. And you don't have to continue to say that as you go to Mass, you're re-sacrificing Christ. No, there was one sacrifice once for all, as Hebrews reminds us. So there's all sorts of really good reasons to be Protestant. There's people, Rome and Orthodox, like to like to dump on the Protestants quite a bit for not having a tradition. But like I've said, I think you actually have a greater tradition as a Protestant. I mean, think about over the last 400 years since the Reformation or so, has it been 400 or has it been 500 years now? It's been uh, however many years, 15, 17. I guess it's been what? That's been 500 years. That's been over 500 years, right? Since then, what great thinkers has the Orthodox or the Roman tradition produced that can go head, toe-to-toe, head-to-head with the Protestant tradition? They, they've they developed their fair share, but I think on its whole, pound for pound, the Protestant tradition has a greater tradition in the last 500 years to a significant extent. We've created and developed greater ecosystems of intellectual support. Now, of course, you look at America in current context, and you think, well, Roman Catholics actually have great um, sort of institutional power, and they have the greatest thinkers in the minds in uh, contemporary American parlance. Well, maybe that's true in America, and and for that and for that, Protestants need to step up and and to build something greater. And that's part of what we tried to do or trying to do with the London Lyceum is create more intellectual resources that are distinctively Protestant and are better than our Roman counterparts. But I think uh, on its whole, if you look at the tradition, you you will find that Protestants can stand up uh, and fight pound for pound, toe for toe, right, toe to toe, with with any Rome or Romish or Anglican. Not Anglican. Why did I say Anglican? Orthodox. Anglicans are Protestants, though some of them are crypto Catholics, right? So th- those are some reasons that I would say that you should be Protestant. I mean, to go back again to the canons of Trent. I mean, how? Let's see here. What's another canon that that's that's relevant here? Canon fifteen says that if anyone saith that a man who is born again and justified is bound to faith to be believed that he is assuredly in the number of the predestinate, let him be anathema. So that that's a common theme throughout the canon of canons of Trent. So that you can't have assurance. That's a good reason to be a Protestant. You want to have assurance of salvation, assurance that uh, that the Lord has elected you and, and that will save you and that you will stand uh, before him justified at the at the end well you should be a protestant if you want to live in anxiety and constant turmoil then go ahead go go jump ship to rome swim the tiber and have no assurance of salvation um, no longer have the ability to think for yourself you have to leave all the decisions up to to your priest and to to the the hierarchical system of rome i mean go for it if that's what you want there's this weird sense for those who are, um, I don't know, drawn to to Rome, is that they have great anxiety as Protestants. They can't make decisions because they don't know which is right. There's all these different options. And they see in Rome, oh, Rome will make the decision for me. Now I don't have to think about what to believe anymore, that my priest or whoever will just tell me what to believe. Great. You've given up one anxiety to only take on another anxiety. Now you have no assurance of salvation anymore. You've lost that. That is no longer something you're allowed to have. That seems like a bad trade. I'd rather not have confidence in various doctrines and not be sure, okay, which which model of baptism is right, which model of, of the, the incarnation is right, what, whatever, and then have no assurance of salvation. That seems like a really bad trade in my opinion. There's there's other canons of Trent that are just bad that you th- that are like you read it and you say ah oh, yeah I should be a Protestant because that just is <coughs> either wrong or 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 it doesn't comport with Scripture or it's just silly <coughs> man I'm sorry guys so I if you didn't know I've been sick a lot recently uh, family's been sick a lot so I I've been struggling to keep up with this stuff just because kids have not been sleeping well and then haven't helped with them. So I appreciate your uh, patience with all this. Um, But I I did want to give you guys top reasons to be Protestant. I've got some cool stuff coming up that I plan to do that I've been 
that I've been thinking about including in here. So as a reminder, top reasons to be Protestant, well, the Bible, well, that's the only, the only reason we really need. But we also have a greater tradition in my mind. But I also have freedom of tradition. So I mentioned that. So I don't have to be sort of like pigeonholed to be a Thomist or a Scotist or, or a Jesuit or whatever. I don't have to do one tradition. I have freedom to sort of pick and choose and do use multiple traditions as I see fit to be a little bit eclectic in my usage of those things. I have great minds in this tradition. I don't have to submit to the Antichrist, the head of the, the head of the church. There's no head of the church other than Jesus Christ himself. I don't have to run defense for Pope Francis. I, and I have a simplicity of worship and ordered worship based around the ordinary means of grace. I mean, what, what better sort of system could you get? So come be a Protestant. That's all I have to say at the end of the day. You should be Protestant. The water's fine. Jump on over here where, uh, where, where we have scripture on our side. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Let me know what you guys think. I appreciate you all for listening, and I look forward to thinking with you guys soon.